Welcome to Shir HaShirim, Song of Songs, Class 24. We are dedicating tonight's class to the departed soul, the recently departed soul of Simcha Sabiha Penina Bat Masuda, excuse me, that's the mother's name, Bat Chaim, which is my dear friend Chaim Gorgi's mother recently passed away. We wish a nechama, a comfort to the family and an alias neshama, an elevation for the soul of the departed and the merit of the learning we do tonight, God willing. Okay, everybody ready to roll? Okay, I'm going to share my screen. The screen share over here. And let's get the correct window. There it is. Okay. So can everybody see the text on the screen? Yes. Thumbs up. Okay. Yes. So we are in Shir HaShirim, Perak Dalet, chapter four of Song of Songs. Last week, we started with verse one. I'm going to review it real fast to catch everybody up. And then we're going to go into verse two tonight. So in verse one, which we have in front of us in this text here, it says, Hinach yafa rayasi. Behold, you're beautiful, my beloved. Hinach yafa. Behold, you're beautiful. Enayich yonim. Your eyes are doves. Mi ba'ad Behind your, we said, we define this as tied back hair. And, and we, so we talked about the, the beauty that was being praised upon the Jewish people at the time this, we are at the period in history at this point in Shir Hashirim of the Mishkan in Shiloh in Eretz Yisrael and the land of Israel. That is after the 40 year sojourn in the desert, the Jews come to settle in Israel and they build a new tabernacle or really they, they just erect the tabernacle Rather than moving through the desert, it's at Shiloh. And this was a time of great unity between the Jews and God. And so the praises in this chapter reflect the beauty that God sees in the Jewish people at this time. So he talks about her beauty of her eyes being doves. We spoke about the loyalty of the dove. We spoke about the tendency of the dove to stretch its neck for the slaughter rather than other birds that spasm when they get slaughtered and the idea of the, the Jewish people, so we, Rashi said that they, they, they put forward their shoulder to take upon it the yoke of God, as opposed to other nations that run from the yoke of God. So that was the contrast of the, the dove with other birds and the beauty that is behind the hair, which is tied back. We said the hidden beauty of the Jewish people that Rashi went said in these highlighted words here, that even the empty ones among you are beautiful to me, says God, even behind where anyone can see, I can see beauty where no one else can see, even in those Jews that to everybody else look like they should not find favor in my eyes. I find the beauty in them. And that is the idea of Sarich Ke'eder Ha'izim, your hair is like the flock of goats and Rashi described the white haired goats Shagalushume Har Gilad that slid down from Mount Gilad, these goats sliding down the side of the mountain. And as they do, their white hair reflects the light. And from way in the distance, people can see flashing lights on the mountain. So it's this very bright flashing beauty that God describes as being the beauty of the Jewish people. And and Rashi gave some specific examples of what that was referring to. And see that class there. So in this, the context of these praises of beauty, we come to the next verse where we have another praise. And here we shall go ahead. So in Pasuk Bet, verse 2. Shinayich ke'eder ha'ketsuvos she'alu min horachza she'kulam mas imos v'shakula in bohem. Which translates as follows. Shinayich your teeth, shinayich, ke'eder ha'ketsuvos, is like the flock of 
Kitsuvos, it's a hard word to translate. Maybe we'll go into it a little bit. But Kitsuvos basically means like the choicest ones, like the flock of the choicest sheep. Your teeth are like a flock of the choicest sheep. Sha'alumen harachza, that have just come up from washing. These sheep have just emerged from the bath. So that's what your teeth are like. Your teeth are like a flock of the most perfect sheep that have just been washed clean. Shekulam mas imos. Now here is an interesting translation because shekulam, that all of them are. Now for those of you who have any Hebrew, I wonder what you, how you would translate this word. Mas imos. Mat imot. Like if I asked you, what does the word matim mean right. in Hebrew? I wonder what somebody would say. Does it's anyone like, have an idea? Yeah, matim, something matim means it's similar, right? It has oh, very matching, good. Matching. Very good. Matching, fitting, similar. And, and the word teom, like twins, teomim, twins, comes from this root, that they are identical, they're matching. So when you say something is matim for something else, you mean it's like a good match. You know, you make a shidduch, you're like, oh, they're very matim for one another. They just, they match together so nicely. So here he's talking about teeth and he says that her teeth are matimot. And I would have said like, your teeth are like symmetrical, you know, because that's a very nice quality to have symmetrical teeth. They shouldn't be jagged and, and off kilter. Like I have, my front teeth are not symmetrical. Is like one is a little longer than the other. It's not such a beautiful quality. It is what it is. But but wouldn't it be nice? And, and isn't it nice to see someone smile and they have these nice teeth that are just straight? Um, that's what I would have thought this means. Rashi says something different. He says, and he, I mean, he's not, he's not so far off, but he just carries us further than we would have gone. That he says matim is related to the word in Hebrew tam. In other words, yeah, there is an aleph over there, but an aleph is kind of like uh, almost like a ghost-like letter. It, it it isn't pronounced all on its own, and it sort of comes and goes. So he says that matim is really just an expanded form of the word tam. And the word tam in Hebrew, what, what does the word tam mean? Usually means simple. Something simple, innocent, plain, innocent. innocent, pure, perfect, whole, right? So he wants to say that the idea over here is that the teeth are perfect. Um, he doesn't relate it to the idea of sort of like symmetry or matching. Like I, I, I would have instinctively read it that way. He talks about the teeth being whole or perfect. Okay, so we'll we'll see what that what that amounts to. Okay, but keep that in mind. And then it says at the end, so they're all mat imot, they're all whole, the teeth are all whole or flawless. Vishakula in bohem, and there is in them no shakul. Now, shakul in Hebrew, where it comes up in my mind, sort of most acutely is when we talk about a dove shakul, there's this concept we find in the Tanakh of a dove shakul. A dove shakul means a bear that has been bereft of its children. And there's this imagery of like the fiercest animal is like the mother bear who's coming out for revenge for her children that have been taken, right? Don't get, don't get in the way of the mother bear. It's like the dove shakul. What? You, you took away one of the bear's kids? She's going to... So she's going to shred you to pieces, right? So shakul means diminished, Rashi says, diminished. Something was taken from them. So he says, v'shakulayin bahem, there's nothing missing, there's nothing diminished from them. So the teeth are matim, they're whole, and there's nothing missing. So if I said they're whole, presumably there's nothing missing. So we have to understand what is the, the double language here of that the teeth are whole or they're perfect flawless and there's nothing missing from them that's the literal translation your teeth are like the flock of choice 
sheep that have come up from the from being washed. They are all flawless, and n- none of them have anything diminishing them. Any questions on that translation? Okay, we're going to go into the symbolism. So I did a lot of the work just now outside, so I'm not going to read through everything in Rashi. But I do want to... I want to just skim over here that he points out that the um, the sheep why are they why are they in such good condition why are these so choice these are the sheep that the shepherd who takes very good care of them that he has chosen to use their wool for clothing so the sheep that you're going to find that are sort of the choicest specimens for wool those are the ones you're going to watch after them that nothing should happen to them and that they're, they should be clean. He keeps them very clean. He washes them every single day. Okay. So that's all included in this idea of the Eder Katsuvos, the flock of choice sheep. Okay. So, um, okay, moving on. Now, here's what it means. Here's the, the uh, metaphoric symbolism. He says, This represents, this imagery represents the mighty ones of Israel, the warriors of Israel. That why is this an imagery representing the warriors of Israel? Because the warriors of Israel, they, they cut off and they consume their enemies with their teeth around them. In other words, this imagery of your teeth are like this. Why is he speaking of teeth? The teeth are those of Israel who go out to war against their enemies. So they have, you know, their sword in hand, their sharp blades, and they're cutting down their enemies like like sharp teeth would go and grind up a morsel of food. So that's the imagery. The teeth are the warriors of Israel going up and, you know, shredding, shredding the enemies all around. Now, what is the praise of that? Why is that so? Why is that to be praised? So he compares them to the flock of choice sheep. Why are the warriors, the soldiers, the fighters of Israel like a flock, a flock of white sheep? So he says, because... They distance themselves from stealing. So in other words, you go out to war and you plunder. You go out to war and you plunder. You take all kinds of spoils. So the one who goes and does the spoiling should say, okay, I captured this, belongs to me, and he'll keep it to himself. However, that's not the case says Rashi, when the Jewish army goes out and takes spoils, the spoils belong really to the whole nation. They don't belong just to the soldier who got his hands on it. So if a soldier would want to put some treasures and cash in his pockets or whatever it is, that would be wrongdoing. But who would stop him and who would know? But the warriors of Israel, even in their fierceness and their courageousness and their fearlessness, going out and waging war and raging war, they don't lose themselves to their passions and then just take whatever they want. They remain, they remain with a commitment to following what is right, doing the right thing in the eyes of God. And they have the fear of God upon them and they don't, they don't uh, dirty themselves with dishonesty. They don't steal. So that is, now if you'll notice, The coloring, what I'm doing over here with the coloring is the blue is the teeth. Your teeth are like these sheep. So the teeth are the wars of Israel in blue. Then I have, uh, they came up from the wash, whatever, because he says they're washed every day, fine. And then over here, he says, look what he says. I skipped a little bit, but they don't dirty themselves with sin. That's the imagery of they came up from the wash. They're clean of sin. I'm showing you how the words are matching in Rashi. So then 
what I did here with they distanced themselves from stealing, I related it to these words here, Shekulam Masimos, they're all flawless, which Rashi over here, he says, Lashon Misom, it means like a, um, an unblemished, an unblemished area. Okay, as like he brings from the verse in Tehillim, in misom bivsari, there's no misom in my flesh. There's no whole part of my flesh. I'm so injured. I'm so wounded. Uh, like Yeshayahu says, mikaf regal va'ad, mikaf regal va'ad rosh in bo misom. From the bottom of my foot to my head, there's no unblemished part of my body because I've been so wounded. In misom bivsari, I don't have a a, a um unwounded area of the body, a whole, a whole area of my body. So that is, uh, and here Rashi says, Kolomar Timimos, that is, they are, they're, they're without flaw, they're perfect, they're whole. So that I wanted to relate to the fact that they didn't steal. And then Rashi adds on here, Umin Ha'arayos, not only did they distance themselves from stealing, but they also distanced themselves from immorality from Arayos. And it's hard to talk about, but we all know the atrocities committed in war. When soldiers raid a town and they take women as prisoners, what unfortunately happens to victimize female prisoners of war, the praise of the Jewish army is they don't do that. They don't steal and they don't commit immoral acts. So this I highlighted in this color, I, I can see the difference. They were kind of similar pinkish colors. One's like a maroon and one's more like a purple. But um, they, uh, that I wanted to consider to shakula in bahem. There's nothing missing from them. And, and, and I'll explain why I divided it up in that way. But both of them come down to sha'alum and arachza. They came up from being washed. That is, they didn't dirty themselves with sin. The army, the soldiers of Israel do not dirty themselves neither with stealing nor with immorality, which are two temptations that comes to a soldier when he's going to war. So what is this referring to more specifically? Says Rashi, kilus al masar elef ish al midyan of a minion. This is talking about the 12,000 men that fought against Midian. This was a topic that came up last week when we spoke in the previous verse about the flock of goats that slid down from Mount Gilad. So Rashi questioned why Mount Gilad in particular was pointed out over here. And he made note of certain incidents in the Torah that revolve around Mount Gilad and which ones this might be referring to. Among them, the soldiers returning from Midian, which was the war that took place at the end of 40 years in the desert, after the Midianites had caused to, the Jews to sin with the daughters of Midian. And they committed sins of immorality. And they committed sins of idolatry. Then the Jews suffered a plague because of that. And many thousands died. And so there was a war that went back against Midian. The Jews were commanded to go to war against Midian. It says to take vengeance for what they had done to the Jewish people. And so Rashi said over here that on their return from there, back to the land of Gilad, coming over the mountains on the return to this land, these soldiers shone brightly like the white-haired goats sliding down the mountain. And that was, we discussed the fact that they did not sin again with the women of Midian the way they had done the first time. So that was a reiteration. Here we have in the second verse, a kind of a re reiteration of that when it speaks of the teeth being the soldiers and the whiteness of the, the teeth, like these white sheep that have been washed, that they are without anything missing. So here... Here, look what Rashi says. So notice the colors again. Not a single one of them was suspect of committing a sexual, an act of sexual immorality. Shenemar, as it said, and this was, we'll go back to last class. You have to go back to last class for this. As it said, when the men returned, 
they announced velo nifkad mi menu ish. They said, we counted all the men who returned from war and not a single one was missing. Not a single man was missing, which we said, according to the pshat, according to the plain meaning, it just means no one died. Every soldier was accounted for. But according to the Gemara, which, under, which again, you have to revisit to see how the Gemara does it. But the Gemara analyzes this on a deeper level to say that the worry of Moshe was about the soldiers returning, Moshe's concern was, did you perhaps return to sin when you put yourself back into the situation of being reunified with these women? Could you were tempted to return to your original sin? And they all said, nifkad ish. not a single one of us is missing. And there Rashi explains the Gemara to mean no one lost his midas yahadus. No one lost his attribute of Jewishness. We did not go back to our sin. We sinned once before. We did teshuva for that. And we remain in our teshuva even now. We didn't give it up. We didn't lose it. So that's the idea of a shaku line by him. There's nothing, there's nothing what? Missing from them. There's nothing diminished from the teeth. No cavities, no cracks, no chipped tooth. Nothing missing at all. Lo nifkad mi menu ish. Not a single one lost what? His attribute of Jewishness, no one fell from the level of tshuva they had achieved prior to that incident. So we have that, we have that again. Um, fine. So he says, Ve'afal hear her halev heviu kaparos, and they also brought atonement for any improper thoughts they had, which perhaps it's impossible to avoid. That's maybe a point I shouldn't gloss over. I was gonna, you know. Okay, whatever. But the truth is, maybe we should we should think about that. It says, "Va'af al hiror halev," and even for the thoughts of the heart, the musings of the heart over sin, heviu kaparosan. They brought an atonement for that. You see, you notice, you notice that the Torah doesn't claim, and the Gemara doesn't claim that they didn't have a temptation. The Torah doesn't claim that they didn't have thoughts of sin. It says they didn't. Despite the temptation and despite, despite the musings over the sin that they could have committed, they remained steadfast. They didn't give in to temptation. They didn't give in to their musings. And on that, they, they brought an atonement for it. There are, cert, there are certain things that the text acknowledges, the Torah acknowledges, the Gemara acknowledges, the commentaries acknowledge, Rashi is acknowledging. Sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes a person can't help but muse and fantasize over sin. But they're not faulted for that because they, they atoned for it. In other words, that we could say, we could clap al khait and say, I'm sorry, God. I, I, I am regretful of that. And there is an atonement for that. We are responsible for our actions. We are responsible for our thoughts. We're not supposed to indulge in fantasies, but we can't always help that we have a Yetzirah. The reality is we have a Yetzirah. We have an evil inclination. That's something God gave us. He put into us so that we should have free will. Without free will, none of our good deeds are meaningful. Without a struggle, what merit do you have for, do, for, for overcoming and doing what's good? So for our benefit, Hashem gives us a struggle. He causes a tug of war inside of us. There are going to be pulls. There are going to be temptations. And we shouldn't let our minds wander after the thoughts that enter, but the thoughts they're going to be. And that's, that's where it begins. That's where it begins. That's why Rashi points out on the verse where it says, Velo sasuru We say it every day in the Shema. Do not turn after your heart and your eyes. So Rashi says it really the other way. He really says the other way. He says the eyes are the salesman for the heart because the eye sees and then the heart desires and then the body goes after. He makes it sort of like the eye comes first. But if you look in the verse, it's don't turn after your heart and after your eyes because very often, yes, it's true. Sometimes first you see a thing and when you see it, that's when the thoughts begin and we have to, you know, close the door on that quickly before it goes anywhere. But 
but sometimes first comes the thought, you know, thoughts trickle in and we can justify to ourselves and we could say, you know, whatever. It's just, it's just thoughts in my head. Right. But the thoughts in my head lead to exploration. Let me go see what I could discover along these lines. I'm only going to look. It's just, it's just looking. That's all it is. And where it goes from there, God forbid. So it can go either way. It can go from the thought to the act. It can go from the seeing to the, to the thinking. But uh, I, there, were, there were sources I was going to talk about this topic last week. You know, we don't have time for everything that, that talk exactly about this issue relating to the men who went out to war that they couldn't help but see what they were going to see. They were going to see the women. They were going to see. What could they do? They were going to see. The question is, what were they going to do after they see? Because sometimes you can't help what you see. And that comes back to that Rashi. The eyes of the salesman for the heart. The eye sees, then he sells it to your heart. So you desire and then you, you go after it. They couldn't help but see what they were going to see in Midian. The question is, how would they react to it? And the commentaries say, if they would see something forbidden for them to see and keep looking, you know, and you know, get a good, a nice, good stare, that would have been a problem. But the declaration to Moshe was what came in front of our eyes without our, without our consent, without our free will, that we had caused us to have thoughts and we're bringing an atonement for that. But we didn't take it any further. We didn't follow our eyes. We didn't let our eyes feast. And then we didn't do anything further than that. So that's summed up here by Rashi, no one committed an act upon the thoughts they had. And the thoughts they had, they brought a, they brought a korban. But I'm pointing out, it doesn't say nobody had any thoughts. Thoughts we're going to have. The question is, where do you go from there? And so hopefully we can take from the example here in Shira Shirim that on the thoughts we'll atone the best we can, but on the rest, we're going to hold on to our midas yahadus. We're going to hold on to that attribute of Jewishness and not allow us to, to shakula. We're not going to get a shakula. We're not going to let any diminishment come to our beautiful teeth that we ought to try to have. Furthermore, says Rashi, They were also not suspect about stealing, like he said earlier. And that also is testified in the verses surrounding that incident. Shehayid alamakasov, the verse says, Vayikhu Eskola Shalal, they took all of the spoils. Vayavi el Moshe el Elazar Akoin. They brought all the spoils to, to Moshe and Elazar Akoin. The, the Torah is very clear. The Torah is very explicit. All the, all the spoils of war, every shred of it, was brought to Moshe and Elazar the, the Kohen, Aaron's son, because Aaron had died already. Here, this is everything we took. We didn't keep anything for ourselves. As it says here, Nobody took for himself a single cow or a single donkey. Clean. Clean. Totally clean. Clean of any stealing. And here it almost fits the word matim, something which is fitting. They only took that which was fitting for them. That is, it belonged to them. If it didn't belong to them, it wasn't matim. It wasn't a match. It didn't fit. I know Rashi doesn't go with that language. He says that there was no, uh, there was there was no lack of wholeness. But that I believe Rashi's relating to the stealing, and then nothing being diminished. I believe Rashi's relating to the sexual sins, which is referred to in the Torah of a man being missing. No man was missing. Shakula, there was no, nothing taken away. That's the praise of the warriors of Israel. Sharp like teeth, white like the cleanest sheep that the shepherd makes sure it's very, very clean because he wants to use their wool. They're so clean, there's no flaw in them. That's the, the warriors of Israel. They go to war, they cut down their enemies, they take spoils, but they don't take for themselves. And there's nothing diminished from them. They didn't lose their attribute of Jewishness through sexual sins. Good questions, comments before we move on. 
I uh, happen to quote over here the, the passage in Bamidbar, which Rashi quotes in Shira Shirim, that they took the spoils, right? There, Rashi in on Chumash says the exact same thing he says over here. It's, it's, it's beautiful to see it. He says, Magid Shahayuk Sherim Vatsadikim. The Torah is telling us, here's Rashi's comment on the Torah, not on Shira Shirim. On Chumash, he says, these Verses are telling us that they were kshirim and tzaddikim. They were kosher. They were righteous. They were not suspect of stealing. To put their hand into the spoils. Without permission. As it says, as it says, all of the spoils, what? They took to Moshe and Aaron. And then he says this. Then Rashi quotes Shira Shirim. Rashi in the Chumash then says, and we learn it from Shira Shirim. And it says explicitly in the received tradition, which is the terminology. I know today we say Kabbalah, we think of mystical things, but in the, in the terminology of the early commentaries um, and the sages, Kabbalah means the words of the prophets. So in there it's, it's explicit in the words of the holy writings. Your teeth are like the flock of sheep. Right, even the the men of war among you, Israel, are all righteous. Even the soldiers are righteous. Think about that. Most people think, you know, I would say the imagery in popular culture of uh, Moshe. I, I hope I hope you're listening to this because I know you're in you're in uh, like armed forces security. So the you know the cultural image of the soldier is like this brute, you know. And he's, you know, the infantryman. He's he's the he's the lowest. <laughs> he's the low. He's just what is he? he just he's just a, a hunk of meat. He's a bunch of muscles. But in the Jewish view, in the Torah's view, the soldiers are tzaddikim. The the soldiers, the warriors, the security forces, the armed forces. These are righteous men. They don't go to war like the way we envision in popular culture. That point was present in the popular culture of even Rashi's time and the times of the sages and perhaps the times of Shlomo himself, that the soldier was regarded as not the most upstanding guy. And the praise of Shira Shirim to the Jewish soldiers are, you are as upstanding as can be. That's, that's how a Jewish warrior, a Jewish soldier should strive to be. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments before verse three? But Rabbi, okay, we'll go ahead. Can, with I, the, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, what? How is this related to the the um, pasukim in the Torah about if a man goes to war and he sees a woman and then he wants to take her as a wife and then she has to grow uh, out her nails and shave else. her head and. Uh huh. Okay. Very good. So it, it actually it actually relates quite well. It actually relates quite well. Um, and that is, I'll tell you. I'll, I mean, it's you know that's a it's a big question. It deserves it deserves a big answer. I'll tell you what. I'll make you a deal. Um, do you have time at the end of the hour, or you have to run at nine o'clock? No, I have time. Because we typically do a Q and A at nine o'clock for people who want to stay later. Um, so if I was going to give you like a quick answer, I would answer it now, but because I want to give you a more thorough answer, I want to save it for after the class. Okay. If it works for you, if not, deal. I'll do my best quickly now. Deal, deal. You have, you have patience later? Patience. I got patience. Sav okay. <laughs> Sav So anyone who's watching, listening now, stay tuned for this question answered. This is the question of the Aishas uh, Yifas Torah. The Torah says in Parshas Kiseitze, Kiseitze no Malcham Al-Yavecha, you go out to war against your enemies and you're going to see a beautiful woman among the enemies and you want to take it for herself. And the Torah gives us a whole bunch of guidelines uh, how to go about doing that. So how does that fit in? We see a beautiful woman and we take her. How does that all go? How does that fit with what I just said? So stay tuned for that. Um, verse three. If I may, if anyone wants to stop me, always welcome to stop me. Always welcome to interrupt. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to go. Verse 3. Verse 3. As follows. 
Okay. Kechut hashoni sifsosayich. Your lips, sifsosayich, your lips, are kechut hashoni. They are like a scarlet thread. Now, before I go any further, I want to point out that this section um, of verses stretches of verse around three, then there's four, five, six. I think they go till verse six, and then there's a break in the text, uh, seven, after verse seven. These are praises of him, the, the Melech Shlomo, the king in the parable, praises of the woman. Uh, he's going to give her a lot of praises till about, till about actually verse six, as we pointed out last week. Then we have another problem come up. Ad hayom till the day grows hot, which we learned in Shira Shirim is the terminology for kind of like the breakup because of some rough patch in the relationship. So that actually happens in verse six um, and is already, by the way, resolved by verse seven, perhaps even by the end of verse six. This is a quick one. But um, so really in verses one to five, we have praises of him to her. And I want to point out, because we see the verses one by one, but if you look at it as a big picture, you see a bigger picture. What can I tell you? You see a bigger picture. He's praising her from the top down, okay? So he started out with her hair. Last week, we spoke about her hair and her eyes, okay? Last week was her hair and her eyes. This week, he comes down. We just learned about her her teeth, okay? Um, and in the verse we're about to examine, he's, I went too far. Sorry, I'm all over the place. He speaks about her lips, and he's going to talk about her rakoseich. And we'll have to see what the rakoseich is. Not so easy to understand. And in the next verse, in the next verse, we have to blush. Uh, no, we don't blush yet. In the next verse, he talks about her neck. Okay. He's going lower. And after that, we blush. Because then he talks about her shnei shodayach. He's going to talk in verse 5 about, about her two breasts. So we're going to, I want to, I, I want to just point out the picture as we go from verse to verse, praising her qualities that you should notice that he's starting up and he's moving down. Okay. So now we're up to the lips. He says, Kichut hashani sif sosayich. Your, 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 your lips are like a scarlet thread. Umid barech nave. And your, now mid barech, like I'm looking at this, I'm like, oh, Midbar is a desert. What does that mean? Her desert is beautiful. Midbar is from the word Dibor, her speech. Your lips are like a scarlet thread and your speech is beautiful. Nave, the way that you speak from your lips, the utter, not only your lips beautiful, but the utterances of your lips are beautiful. Kefelach harimon rakoseich. Now your raka is like the half of a pomegranate, right? You cut a pomegranate in half and you have half a pomegranate in your hand. So this is the, um, this is what, what is described as your rakoseich. The question is, what does rakoseich mean? And we'll come to it. And then he says here, mi ba'ad litzamoseich. Behind your, again, this is the same terminology we had in verse one when he was describing her hair. And Rashi said over there, Mibala Tzamaseich is behind your tied back hair. The question is, how does that, how does that fit in in this verse when he's not talking about her hair anymore? And it's a little mysterious. And maybe, maybe we'll come to a solution for it, maybe not. The question is, what does it mean, Rakoseich? And Rashi defines Rakoseich as follows. He says, Rakoseich, okay, over here. It says he gova haponim, it is the high part of the face. Shakorin pomil belaz. In French, it's called pomil. The question is, what is that? Okay, eight salha inaim. It is next to the eyes. Will shown gemara korin osa rumane de ape, and in the gemara it's called rumane de ape. Now, if you ask me, rumane de ape. I would say, oh, rumane from the word rome in Hebrew, which means high, the high part of the face. Like Rashi says, gova ha right? 
So I, I was trying to figure this out and I went to a lot of dictionaries and I'll show you something that I found um, here. So the word pomel, which Rashi identifies, like we have an English, like a pommel horse, you thought about. So the pommel, a pommel in old French, I found is a knob or a ball, like on a saddle. In the front of the saddle, you have this like roundish knob that sticks up. It's like a, a handle, right? It's a, this round high thing from the word pum, which is the word for an apple, like a pomegranate, like a pum de terre, which is a, uh, and literally means the apple of the earth. It's a potato, like in Hebrew, tapuach adama. Um, and so this word in modern French, pomet is a cheekbone. And so I Rashi, I thought maybe is describing cheekbones because he says it's by the eyes. It's on the high part of the face, right? And then I looked up in the dictionary of the Targum and, and, the, and the Talmud, Rumana, which Rashi says, Rumana de Apias, at the height of the face. So it actually translates Rumana as a pomegranate and also the upper part of the cheek. So it seems like everybody in all languages agrees for some reason that the, the upper part of the cheek, perhaps the cheekbones, like we saw here, the cheekbone has this sort of roundish, ballish quality to it. That and it's Rashi even says here. Look at this. Now Rashi describes it. He says. Um, he says here. Um, it's it is. Shehu adam usgalgal. It, it's similar, domen lefelach, chatsi rimon. It's like it's like the half of a pomegranate, mibachutz, on the outside. It's like the outside of the half of a pomegranate, shehu odom uskalgal, which is like red and purplish. It's like, a, so you think like you're pinching somebody's cheeks, they get all red, right? And they're round and they're by the eyes. This is what I think he's describing, but I have no idea what it means, mibachutz amasech, that now it's behind your, what he defines Samasek in verse one, it's behind your tied back hair because your cheeks are not behind your tied back hair. So I really struggle to understand how, how he puts this all together. But anyway, what, is this, what does it mean in the end of the day? The lips are like a scarlet thread. This is very beautiful. I don't know how much we'll be able to do in the next few minutes, but whatever we do, it's worth it. He says this about... What does it mean that your lips are like a scarlet thread? Naos lehavtiach, says Rashi, they are beautiful in their promises that they make. Velishmar havtachasam, and in keeping those promises. Now notice again what I did with the colors. I believe because we have, we have the lips like the scarlet thread and we have the speech, which is beautiful. And here in in commenting on the words, your lips are like a scarlet thread, Rashi says, you're beautiful in your promises. Now your promises are the utterances of your mouth. That should more likely go on the midbarich nove. Your speech is beautiful because your promises are your speech. And Rashi says, they're beautiful, right? So, and then he says, the lishmor haftachasam and in keeping your promises. So I divided this into two pieces and I said, the scarlet thread is the promises. The speech is beautiful. That's going on the keeping of the promises because the promises aren't beautiful until you keep them. In other words, if you don't make a promise, it's nothing at all. If you make a promise and you don't keep it, that's not nice, right? But if you promise something good and keep it, the keeping of the promise retroactively makes what you promise good. So the lips, what, what emerges from the lips become beautiful when they are fulfilled. So I see it as like two things. The, the, the lips at first, like where the words come from, it's beautiful, but only retroactively once the words which emerge show themselves to be beautiful and that they're being kept. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to substantiate this as we, as we go, but hold that. Hold that in mind. Now, here's where he brings the example. Now, remember, in Rashi's big picture of Shir Hashirim, we're moving through Jewish history. We finished the period of the desert, and we are focused in this chapter on the period of the 
tabernacle at Shiloh under Yehoshua. Now you're going to say to me, but Rabbi, you just told me about all the soldiers in the desert at the time of Moshe. What were we doing over there? So again, if you were in last week's class, you might understand that Rashi is comparing the present beauty to that beauty. That beauty stands as something, a certain quintessential beauty that he's bringing into the present beauty to say, you're beautiful to me now like you were then. And that comes up many times when he describes the tabernacle as being like Mount Sinai, as being like the tabernacle in the desert. Um, you crowned me that day like you crowned me on those days. Those are all things we found. So just to uh, alleviate that confusion, when he's praising the people in the desert, he's in the time of Moshe, he's using that praise to import it to the present of this chapter, which is the time of Yeshua, to say, even now you're like that. And we're going to see it right now. Because he says, this is like, Kemosha asu hameraglim l'rachav hazona. This is like the spies did to Rachav, the woman of ill repute. Who was Rachav, the woman of ill repute? I'll give you a quick Tanakh lesson in Yehoshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 2. We find before the Jews enter the land of Canaan, Yehoshua sends ahead two spies. They're not identified in the text. Our rabbis tell us these were Kalev ben Yefune. Caleb, who was from the original group of spies who sinned, but he was one who didn't sin. Yoshua was the other one who didn't sin, so they survived. And with him, Pinchas, the son of Elazar, the son of Aharon, who also stood out among the Jewish people when they were committing certain sins, that he went ahead and put a stop to it single-handedly. He showed his righteousness in a in a special, outstanding way. He was chosen for this mission. These two spies go into the land of Canaan to go and sort of scout ahead and take stock of the situation. In so doing, they come to the city of Yericho, which was the first city on the border, very highly fortified. And the idea was if we could figure out how to, how to, um, how to open that jar of pickles, right? If you can, if you can unlock that castle, you basically have unlocked the doorway to the entire land. So what's the deal with Yericho? And they go there to the inn, who was run by a woman named Rachav. She was a woman of ill repute. You could imagine what went on in her inn. And they go there. You have to imagine they go there because that's where all the, the prominent, this was like a high-end place. All the prominent politicians would go there for their holidays. So she would be the one who got every single important officer in the land to loosen their lips and give up their secrets to her. If anyone have, would have the secrets of the land of Canaan, it was her. And it worked like a charm because she basically says, I've, I've been doing this for 40 years and I know what's going on everywhere with every governor in this country and they are scared stiff of you. You will have no problem coming in and just deleting everybody. So while they're hiding in her inn, they're discovered. The king of Canaan sends guards to extract them and she hides them. She hides them and then she helps them to escape by lowering them out the window using a scarlet thread. She takes a scarlet cord, a cord made of scarlet thread, and she uses it to lower them from the window. Now over there, Rashi says something amazing that I, I, I went to the passage in Yeshua to bring it in here, but Rashi says, why does the, the what, what is the significance of this cord? So Rashi says, with this, this very cord, and through this very window, the adulterers would come into her. She used this window like somebody wanted to come in secretly and didn't want to come through the front door so people should discover that he's doing this. So there was a, you know, there was a back way in. You came in through the window and you climbed up the, the rope that she left hanging over there. So she used this rope to commit many adulterous acts. And now she uses it to save the Jewish spies. 
Why? Look how our sages examined this episode. She said, Master of the universe, Be'elu Khatasi, with these I have sinned, with this window and with this cord I have sinned. Be'elu Timcholi, with these please forgive me. She does teshuva. She does teshuva. And she says, I wish to rectify my, my wrong acts from my past. I'm going to show you how sincere I am by taking those things which were my vessels to commit the sin, and I'm going to dedicate them to you. I'm going to use them to save these Jewish spies from the king's guards. And she lowers them through the window, and she makes them promise her. She says, she says promise me, swear to me, that because of this kindness that I've done to you, I didn't have to. But in return for that, you'll spare me and my family when you conquer this place. And they swear to her. They swear to her. Now here, I just want to I just want to go through a little bit that episode and what Rashi says. So she tells them, she tells them exactly what to do. She says, go and hide in the mountains for three days. After three days, you can come through and the guards won't find you because they've gone looking for you and they're only going to look for you for three days and then they're going to stop looking. So hide for three days and then you're, you're safe to travel back to where you came from. So Rashi asks, how did she know what the guards would do? How did she see the future? So Rashi says this, Ro'asa beruach hakodesh. She saw with divine inspiration, she yashuvu l'sof shloshes yamim, that they would come back after three days of searching. Ruach hakodesh. This is a woman that by her own confession, she spent 40 years of her life as a woman of ill repute committing adultery with countless individuals. Is there anyone dirtier? Is there anyone lower? In a moment, she did teshuva. She said, I regret it all. I commit my life to Hashem, the one God of Israel. I commit all the, the tools that I used to bring myself into this sinful life to bring me out of it. And in that one moment of teshuva, she achieved prophecy. Prophecy. She was cleansed completely. Think of the scarlet thread in the story. Think of the scarlet thread on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which turns white and shows that our sins are forgiven. It was like this was her Yom Kippur. This was her scarlet thread. And she was made white in that moment. She became a, a, a prophetess. Now, she's not listed among the prophetesses. It says Ruach HaKodesh. It seemed to be a low level, like she had, you might say, a premonition. Somehow she knew. We wouldn't call it prophecy, but God seems to have given her inside information at this moment. She achieved a very high level of holiness. Now it gets even better. So it says, afterwards, they came back to Yehoshua. Now watch what it says. When they come back to Yehoshua, they are called Malachim. They're called Malachim in the verse. Okay? Not here, but in verse, in chapter 6. These same people, it's when, when they save Rachav, it says they save her, Ki es ha-malachim, because she, say, she hid the angels that Yehoshua had sent to spy the land. Now, malachim, full transparency, means messengers, okay? That's really what it means here, messengers. But they're called many things, Rashi points out. They're called anoshim, they're called ne'arim, and they're called malachim. One time they're called malachim. Many times they're called anoshim, which means men, and many times they're called ne'arim, which means lads. And Rashi explains why each usage is. So why suddenly at the end of the story are they called malachim? Why is that word chosen for, for messengers? Right? They're called miraglim, spies. Why malachim? Why use the word for angels? So Rashi says this. He says, Uvalayla harishon, that first night that they went out and they were in Rachav's house, they were like angels. Because they guarded themselves from committing a sin with Rachav. They, they were like angels, right? And that's why they're called angels, says Rashi. Now you're going to ask, yeah, but she did teshuva. But before she did, it seemed, but in other words, all of this just comes to heighten what I'm going to say. What do you mean do a sin with her? She did teshuva. Obviously, she had quit everything. No, not so fast. Not so fast. That means in the beginning of the night, she was still in full sin mode. She was still a full whatever she was, right? When they entered the house. It was only after some point 
point in her encounter with her, with them, that she did teshuva? And what was the point? At what point did she change from being the way that she was, that they could have sinned with her? That was her livelihood, right? They could have done this, and yet they don't. And I'm going to bet you this, because it's not explicit, but how else do you explain this? That she tried to tempt them. She tried. She says, oh, you come here? I know what you're here for. And she, 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 she puts on her whatever, you know, her whole act. And they remain steadfast. They don't sin like all the themes we had in the previous verses. And she says, like angels, these men are. How could it be? Who are you? And she discovers that they're Jews. And she says, such a person exists. Such a person exists in this world that could resist me. If, if such a person exists that has such power over their evil inclination, I've never met 40 years, I've never met a person like you. There's something supernatural about you. There's something different about you. I'm inspired. I, I, I have seen something that I've never seen before. I aspire to be like you. How can I be like you? In that moment, she did teshuva because of the chastity that she saw in them. The Gemara has a very similar story about, um, let's call it a yeshiva student who hears about a woman of ill repute and he has a strong desire to be with her. Most exclusive one, you know? And so, I mean, you don't know. I don't know either, but that's what it says. So he goes to her and, and in the midst of almost con committing the sin, as he's getting undressed, it says that his tzitzis smack him in the face. His tzitzah smack him in the face. And when his tzitzah smack him on the face as he's trying to take them off, he comes to his senses. He's like, what am I doing? Tzitzah is a reminder of the commandments. How could, how could I have allowed myself to get into the situation? And he resists her. And she says, resist me? No one has ever resisted me. How could you possibly resist me? And he explains to her how the tzitzah had this impact on her. And so he leaves. But then shortly thereafter, she shows up at the yeshiva and she says, I'm the one that he went to and he resisted me. And if there's such a power on earth, I want to be a part of that. I want to be part of this nation. And she converts to Judaism and he marries her. There's a story in the Gemara. Now here, I know I'm over time a little bit, so I'm going to try to wrap it up. We won't finish the verse. But we'll finish this phrase and we'll continue next time. Because it's such a powerful idea. So Rashi says they, they resisted sinning with her. And that's why they're called angels. So by resisting sinning with her, she saw in them some divine spark that turned her on. And she said, I'm ready to get rid of all this and be with you. And she commits herself totally. She becomes a prophetess. And now at the end of the story, at the end of the story, to make a long story short, our rabbis teach us that actually, I would show you the sources, but we don't have time. Our rabbis teach us that actually Yehoshua marries Rachav. He, Yehoshua, the prophet, the leader of Israel, marries her. And from her, not only does he marry her, but because he married her, her descendants from Yehoshua go on to marry other great families within Israel. And from them, our rabbis tell us, come some of the greatest prophets of Israel, and they're listed off who they are. Among them, some of the big names that came from this couple, Yoshua and Rachav. And if I had time to tell Yoshua's backstory, you, you, know, you wouldn't be able to hold on to your socks, but it's not for now. Among their descendants was Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah the prophet, and Yechezkel, Ezekiel. So this is a holy woman. She turned her life around in a moment. I believe very strongly that this is part of the messaging of the scarlet thread that's referenced in our verse. Rashi doesn't by coincidence reference Rachav, but the reason Raf, Rashi does it outwardly is the fact that the spies fulfilled their promise to her. They made her a promise. They swore to her. We are going to keep our word to save you and your family, and they do it. They save her. They do save her. And that's the chut hashani sif sosayach midbarech nove. 
your lips are like the scarlet thread and your speech is beautiful because you promised something good and you fulfilled it. The promise, what was the promise? Regarding the scarlet thread. So that's why the scarlet thread is the use of the imagery for the lips, which speak beautiful words and fulfill them beautifully. Now we didn't get to the pomegranate is, you know, the, uh, her cheeks are pomegranates. Um, I'll do it real fast. I mean, it's really what I'll do it literally in one minute, but we just won't solve all the mysteries and we'll suffice to go on. But Rashi says that what it means is rakoseich is from the word in Hebrew rake, which means empty. That's why many of the, the, the commentaries say it refers to more like the cranium or the eye socket, which is an empty space. But be that as it may, why is this part of her, which is described as something, which is a word meaning empty, compared to a pomegranate? Rashi says these words. He says, Reikhanim Shabeich, like we saw last week, because the empty ones, the empty ones among you, Reikhanim, Rakoseich, your empty ones, Meleim Mitzvos Kirimon. They are full, they are filled with mitzvos, with commandments that are fulfilled like a Rimon. And to link that to what we said last week, we have, we talked about the empty Jews. So the empty Jews. They're full of mitzvahs. They do many, many good things. Maybe not that we could see, but Hashem knows. And he praised her in that verse, and he praises her here again with that praise. So here we're going to pause it. I'm going to, I'm going to shift now to the question that Mrs. Friend asked. If people have to go, no problem. If you want to stay and listen, feel free to stay and listen in. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, any, any comments before I take Mrs. Friend's question? Okay, so she asked regarding, we have regarding um, the Torah speaks about a woman, a man goes out to war and he sees a beautiful woman. The Torah says that he's allowed to take her. However, he has to, she has to sit in sackcloth. She has to shave her head. She has to uh, grow out her nails. It's a question whether she's growing out her nails or she's cutting her nails. But all of these things are meant to make her unsightly. She has to sit like a mourner in his house for 30 days. She's crying, you know, all day. I miss my parents. I miss my house. She looks very, very unsightly. Shaved head, wearing a potato sack, right? So the Torah says, look, if you go out to war and you're, blood's boiling and you're very impassioned and suddenly you see a beautiful woman and you're overtaken with, with passion and you want to commit an act with her, God forbid. So the Torah says, okay, okay, fine. And Rashi says over there, Lo dibra Torah the, Torah, the Torah only speaks opposite the evil inclination. Meaning somehow the Torah knows that a man can work himself into such a frenzy that he cannot be denied. He cannot be denied his desire. So there is a concept, and it's a big concept within Judaism of, so to speak, giving the devil its due. That Hashem says, I understand where you want to go, and it's very undesirable. And I understand that if I tell you, no, you will completely ignore me. And we understand in psychology this idea that if you give someone no way out, they, they go crazy. They go crazy. But if you offer someone a way out, he calms down because he always feels a sense of security like I'm not, I'm not in such terrible danger. So when it comes to even our desires, if Hashem would give us no outlet, so we would just ignore him. We would just ignore him. There's a verse in Tehillim that says, Ki imacha hasilicha. Lema'antivare, it's in Psalms 130. It means, for with you is forgiveness, lema'antivare, in order that we should have fear. In other words, I should fear sin. Why should I fear sin? Because with you is forgiveness. Now, wait a second. Because you are forgiving, I should fear sin. It seems to be the opposite. If I knew you were unforgiving, if I knew there was no atonement for sin, if I knew that sin meant damnation in hellfire forever, then I would be afraid to sin. But if I know I could be forgiven, I'll be easygoing about sin. What do you mean? 
for with you is forgiveness in order, lemaan, so that I should have fear, tivare, I should have yira, I should have fear. So one of the commentaries I saw said that if there would be no forgiveness for sin, we would commit one sin and we would go, it's over, it's over. Forget about it, I sinned, my life is over, God will never forgive me, I'm going to hell forever. What, is it? what does it matter anymore? I'll just do whatever I want. I'm going to hell anyway. I've heard people talk this way. I'm going to hell anyway. So I might as well have a good time on the way there, right? But, but, but Hashem's telling us, no, no. I'm forgiving. I'm forgiving. There's a way out. There's a way out just because you messed up with one sin. That means that, that means it's all over. No, you, you ought to be careful about sin because you could leave this world sin free. Because even though, yes, you will sin in your lifetime, but there are, there are means of atonement. So as long as you have this feeling, I can, I, can, I can get out of the situation I'm in, then I won't be complacent to stay there. I'm not going to commit myself to sin if I don't have to, if I'm given a way out. So if God would say there's no path for indulgence, so we'd say, I, 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 can't, I can't handle that. That's too hard for me. So God says, okay. I'm going to give you a permitted way. And that already cools, it already cools the passion because I, 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 I feel, you know, if I want to, I could kind of do it anytime, right? Because I, I have this way, so I don't need to do it right now, right? So, God gave this commandment opposite the Yitzhahara that we knew, we knew that a man would have a passion in this type of visceral situation that could become uncontrollable. So I have to offer him an avenue, a permitted avenue, and immediately he cools down. Okay, okay. It's like um, Costco's return policy, lifetime return policy. As long as you have the receipt, you can return the item. Okay, great, so what happens? I buy a thing from Costco. I realize I don't need it, I don't want it. I wanna give it to someone as a gift, he already has one. Okay, I'll, I can return it anytime. I stick it in the garage and it stays there forever. I never get my money back, but why? I'll return it next weekend. I'll return it next weekend. I'll return it. But when it's like seven day returns, I got to get it back there, right? So as my point is that when you have a way out, you're chilled out. You're, you're chilled out. You're not in a hurry. So this mitzvah was given as a way immediately of cooling the man's passion. That's number one. Number two is it's a, dis, it's a dissuasion. And oh, so uh, along that line, so he goes, okay, okay, I can do it. I can do it. I, I just have to follow these rules. Okay, I have to follow the recipe. Fine. I'm not going to just rush into things. I'm going to follow the recipe. Okay, nice lady. I like you. You're my prisoner. Here, you're going to be my, my wife soon. But first, we have to go through this process. What a terrible way to make it shut up, right? So, so okay, I have to shave your hair. Ah, and then you look at her. She's like, oh, you don't look so good like you used to, right? So, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm in bed. I'm embarrassed, I'm embarrassed to admit it. When I was a young, when I was a young fellow and I was dating, I went on a date with a girl and she wore a, she wore a cute hat and, and, uh, and I, I, I liked her a lot. I went on a second date with her. She didn't wear her hat. I didn't like the shape of her head. <laughs> I was like, she's too flat headed for me. Stupid. Right. Okay. I, I admit, but in other words, he looks at her and, you know, we talked a lot about hair in, in Shir Hashirim and hair is, is a very prominent feature of beauty on a woman. So God says, oh, you want to make a wife? No problem. Shave her head. I'm like, okay, okay. I'm going to shave her head. Okay. And you're like, never mind. Right. And then, and then, and then it's like, yeah. And then uh, it was put her in a potato sack. You know, when she's wearing her nice clothes, like in the situation of Midian, where the women were deliberately trying to tempt so then, you know, there's an attraction, but then you put her in a potato sack and it doesn't complement her figure and you're, you're, that attraction goes away. And one, and she's going to sit there crying. She's going to have tears. Her makeup's going to smudge and, uh, you know, and her eyes are going to get all red and her nails are growing out and, uh, and she's all miserable. I miss my mom. I miss my dad. It's not attractive. It's not attractive. So Hashem gave you this way. So you're like, okay, I'm going to take that avenue. Then all of a sudden along the way, you just, you, 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 you get totally, totally dissuaded. So, so there's a dissuasion over there. So again, that also fits into the chastity of the warriors of Israel and the, uh, the final, the final piece that I'm gonna lay down over here is that they asked this Kasha, what are you, what are you talking about? That you got they basically asked exactly your Kasha, the, the rabbis. They say, wait a second, you got through telling me 
what big tzaddikim these warriors were. For example, to tell you what big tzaddikim they were, we, we talked about tonight what big tzaddikim they were, but the Torah makes a bigger deal out of it because the Torah says before you go to war, a lot of rules of war, says that the, the priest or whoever is uh, the Kohen Meshuach Melchama, the priest who's anointed over the war. Uh, he doesn't go to war, but he gives a pep talk to the soldiers. So he says, he says to them, many of you have to go home. You cannot go to war. If you just got married and it's your first year of marriage, you have to go home and be with your wife. If you're exempt. You're exempt from the army. Go home. If you just built a house and it hasn't been a year, go home. You have to enjoy your house. If you just planted a vineyard and you didn't get to taste the wine of it yet, go home. You have to enjoy your vineyard before you die in a war. Certain, certain enjoyments you're entitled to before you die. If you just got married, spend a year with your wife first before you go to war. Built a house, planted a vineyard, fine. And then the fourth category, it says, and anyone who is afraid, anyone who is fearful and soft of heart, you should also go home. So Rashi tells us, our rabbis tell us that, what was he afraid of? He was afraid that because of his sin, he may not merit God's protection and will die in the war. That's the fourth character. If you're afraid because of a sin you have, go home now. And in fact, the commentaries go further to tell us that the first, first, the first three categories, they were true. If anyone was in that category, they could go home. It wasn't, it wasn't a total fake out. But the only reason they were put there was so that the sinful guy who was embarrassed that he would say, oh, uh, anyone who is afraid because he sinned should go home and like he's going to turn around and start walking away and everyone's going to go, eh, he's a sinner, eh. right? So he shouldn't be embarrassed. The sinner could walk away and be like, yeah, I'm playing a vineyard. Uh, you know, I got to get back to my new house. You know, everybody had a way without, to go without being embarrassed, which is a whole nother level of beauty that Hashem refused to embarrass the sinner. There's a lot about that. But, but in other words, all four categories, really, really what they boil down to, if you had a sin, don't be here. And whoever left, left. So whoever stayed, these were people that were certain they had not sinned. Or if they sinned, they were certain they had done teshuva. Okay? That's not a bunch of schleppers. Okay? These are people on a high level. Now, not only that, but it says among the sins, it counts among the sins that you would have to go home for is a person who spoke between putting on his tefillin of the hand and putting on his tefillin of the head. If he spoke in between, he was not qualified to go to the army because that was too great a sin that he could not count on God's divine protection. Okay? So we're talking about tzaddikim. The army was literally a bunch of sinless people. Literally. Besides what the shir shir say, the Torah tells us too. Now, this guy, these tzaddikim, so it's Revel Yashiv, and it's Rav Shlomo Zaman Arbach, and... Think of the biggest sadi you can think of. These are the guys that are going out to war. Then they see a lady and they're like, oh, I can't control myself. <laughs> right? Really? Really? So here's where the third approach comes in. And the third approach is this. This is more of a Hasidic approach. Okay? Admittedly. That there are sparks. There are sparks of holiness. Even within unholy and impure things. There's a very big theme in Kabbalah. There's a very big theme in Hasidus. And our job is to, as the Jew is to sort of lift the sparks that are hidden within these dark shells called klipas, like, literally like shells. And we have to lift them out of those klipas that they're in, okay? I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go too far on a tangent. I'll just give one example that like we have this, idea of like bottle you have something forbidden a forbidden piece of food goes and mixes in with uh with a uh, kosher food right it gets mixed in like one piece of uh non-kosher meat mixes in within many pieces of kosher meat right so what happens i can't find it it's in there somewhere should i not eat the plate of meat no it's nullified in the majority so because it's nullified in the majority that means if i eat that piece it's kosher. I didn't sin. What do you mean? If I ate it alone, that's a sin. It's not kosher. But when it went and mixed in, 
without my knowledge, I can't throw it in there and be like, hey, see you later when I eat you. Mix, mix, mix. I can't do that. That's forbidden. Then the whole mixture becomes forbidden. But if by accident it falls in, suddenly I can eat it. I can eat the whole plate. I don't even have to leave one over and be like, maybe that's the one. I can eat every one. So I know I ate, I know I ate the forbidden one. It was permitted when I ate it. How? So aside from just, well, that's the, what the halacha states. On deeper sources, they explain that the, 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 the spark that was within there was covered by a klipa. It was covered by this impurity. If you had it alone, impurity, you can't do that. But somehow in the mixture, the Torah reveals to us that it, through this process, that klipa is removed the spark is elevated and now it becomes and now it became for, it per, permitted it's like literally a piece of pig could become kosher so the jews go through exiles and they collect the sparks as they go uplifting the sparks uplifting the sparks and all this leads to redemption when all the sparks are freed from the klipas that they fell into when the vessels broke these are kabbalistic terms so that means the idea of the Yafas Tawar, according to these commentaries, is that even within these women, there are sparks, there are some sparks of purity. And the only ones who can detect it are the tzaddikim. Only the tzaddikim are, have the spiritual sensitivity that like when they're in proximity of a spark, they're like, you know, spider sense alert, spark alert, spark alert. There's a spark here and they are irresistibly attracted to these sparks. The, the, the attraction, the tempt, I don't want to call it the, the draw to uplift the spark is irresistible for the tzaddik. So the tzaddikim have to go to war. They have to enter these dark places and they will find the sparks. Like, uh, I don't want to say what it's like, but so all of a sudden, there's a Yafas Toar. There's a, <gasps> there's a spark in there. I must uplift it. And it becomes irresistible to them. So therefore, then the Torah gives us the, this purification process. That, by the way, like I said before, if they decide midstream, this is not for me, then that's what it is. But, but the idea here is that there is a, there's a spiritual holy spark in these women that only the tzaddikim can detect. And when they detect it, they are drawn to it with an irresistible urge. And that is how a tzaddik can become irresistibly attracted to a woman out at war because his neshama wants so badly to uplift the spark that he detects is within her. Now, after all that I've said just now, as an approach to how do we stim how do we put together these two things of the righteous of Israel together with the Torah's commandment regarding literally taking a woman captive and making her your wife is to say that, I'm just trying to think, the Gemara gives certain, certain examples of situations the Torah speaks about that never took place. I was just thinking, is this one of them? No, I don't think this is one of them. I don't think this is one of them. I was thinking the Ben Soramora, the, the, the rebellious son that they stoned, that never happened. And the house with Saras, you know, the house with leprosy, that never happened. And the Gemara says, so why even does the Torah talk about it? Just to give us reward for learning about it, theoretically. Um, I was going to say this never even happened. There's like a further answer. And, and it never happened, by the way. You know, All that's theoretical. But actually, I think it did happen. I think we find with David HaMelech that, he did one of his wives, at least one of his wives, was a Yafas Toar. And the offspring of her made trouble for this reason, which Rashi points out, that if in the end of the day, and how does this stem with the Hasidic approach? I don't know. But if at the end of the day, a person does give in to their urge and does make this woman his wife, even after all the safeguards the Torah put in place, um, he'll end up regretting it because... Immediately afterwards, the to the next the net literally the next section in the Torah is about the the hated wife. If a man has two wives, one beloved and one hated, right? So 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 Rashi says, why does it? Why do these two sections follow one another? Because if you take a your fast Torah, this is not going to work out well, okay? And then immediately after that, the next section is the rebellious son, the rebellious son who doesn't listen to his mother, his father, and he's a glutton, and he drinks wine, and he steals, and he murders, and they stone him, right? Yeah. 
if you engage in th- this type of matchmaking, not only will the marriage not be a happy one, but the children that come from this relationship are going to give you nothing but trouble. So don't do it. In the end of the day, it's a big don't do it. But I think, I hope that it presented a number of ways to, to uh, um, weave together th- these concepts of how the Torah can have such a thing as the Yafas Torah. And we could still praise the soldiers of Israel of being very, very great, holy and righteous men. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I really, so much understanding, so much layers, so many layers underneath, just really stunning. Baruch Hashem. That's why I told you, I really wanted to give it its proper treatment. So I saved it for after the class. Thank you very much. You know, it's like, it's like a separate class. (laughs) Anyway, thank you so much for coming. Any other questions before we call it a night? Fine. You know how to reach me. God willing, see you next week. Thank you. Shavuot Tov.